and welcome to, to the 3D Viz Symposium on 3D Visualization Projects in, in Cultural Heritage. And welcome to Oxford University Museum uh, of Natural History. If you don't know the museum, it's uh, since situated in the centre of the university in Oxford, and it opened in 1860. If this was a normal year, uh, we would be having 800,000 people through the door um, in a typical year um, to see a proportion of our 7 million specimens uh, that we have, mainly behind the scenes, but, but obviously on display uh, as well. It was created initially as, as the, the main science faculty for the University of, of Oxford, uh, and each of the departments started its history uh, within this building before they grew and they moved out, uh, mainly to buildings in the adjacent science campus. Uh, so we still remain very tightly linked uh, with the science departments in, in the University of, of Oxford. This conference arose as a partnership uh, with, or from a partnership, with the Centre for Imaging Metrology and Additive Technology at WMG, um, a, a group led by Professor Mark Williams, who we'll hear from later in, in the conference. And Mark was keen to explore the sorts of 3D visualisation techniques that they were using uh, on a, a daily basis uh, with their in industry interfaces and see how they might apply to science museums, but, but to cultural heritage more broadly. And we've been working together now for around five years. One of the uh, early fruits of, of that partnership was a, a PhD, uh, co-supervised by Mark and I, uh, looking at, at uh, museum evaluation and, and the use of 3D prints in, in museums. And that was Paul Wilson's PhD, who's organized this meeting. Paul went on to become uh, an early career fellow at the Institute of Advanced Study at the University of Warwick. And we're very grateful to them uh, for, to them for supporting uh, this conference. We initially uh, hoped that we'd be able to meet in person uh, within the museum, uh, but of course COVID intervened. So we, we've gone online, um, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to, to see as much of, of the, uh, the work that's been carried out across the sector uh, as we originally planned. It's very appropriate this, this meeting should be in uh, Oxford University Museum of Natural History because in a way, uh, one of the early professors of geology, William Solis, acted as a progenitor for what we would now consider to be the routine technique of um, scanning using X-ray CT or synchrotron, uh, segmenting a, an object out and then printing it in 3D. But he was doing it in an entirely analog way. Um, he took up his, his professorship in 1897, uh, had a remarkable stint. He died in post uh, in 1936 at the age of 87. Um, so when we moan about retirement ages in, in the modern era, um, it was considerably different uh, way back when. The technique that he used was, was one of serial grinding, not serial sectioning, that had been done quite a lot. But he realized that there was a lot of missing data uh, that occurred where the saw blades cut. And so he wanted to increase the resolution of his uh, 3D reconstructions. So he developed uh, a machine that we still have in the museum to serially grind fossils, um, fraction of a millimeter by, by fraction of, of a millimeter. He would then draw that uh, polished surface or photograph it later on. And from that, he would then create a wax layer and gradually, sequentially, um, he would uh, create the, the 3D reconstruction. He used many of the, the techniques that are, are familiar to us at, at the modern day. He was looking at the skull roof of ichthyosaurs, for example, and he would color code uh, the different bones of the skull roof uh, in different colors so that they could be picked out in the three dimensional wax model, something that we, we routinely see in paleontological papers at, at the modern day. And he looked across a wide spread of, of the animal kingdom from graptolites to ichthyosaurs to primitive fish and, and primitive amphibians. So he was very much uh, ahead of his, his time. And although, of course, we've, we've now gone over to, to CT scanning and, and uh, 3D printing, actually for some fossils in the museum that uh, are, are very recalcitrant when it comes to CT scanning, it's very hard to image them. We do still use Solace's original technique, not his original equipment, I'm pleased to say, but his original technique, and that particularly applies uh, to a group of fossils we'll probably hear a, a bit more of later on in the conference, 
uh, from a, an exceptionally preserved deposit in, in Herefordshire on the Welsh borders. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Paul Wilson, who's very much organised this conference, um, and he'll say a few more words. All right. Uh, hello, hello, everyone. Um, as, uh, thank you for your kind words, Paul. Much appreciated. And um, I guess without any further ado, uh, let's. Um, I, I would like to welcome everyone to 3D Biz Symposium on 3D Visualization Technologies and Cultural Heritage. As Paul has said, uh, I am uh, Paul Wilson, and uh, I'm, as he said, I'm a research fellow at the University of Warwick, and I have quite a strong interest in, I guess, 3D printing and um, X ray computer in engaging museum audiences through tangible interaction. Uh, as Paul has said, it's been very nice to actually be able to run this event in any capacity, see, considering the, uh, the obviously the impact of a, a rather large global pandemic that's currently underway. Um, but I did, in our ideal world, we would have had our first event back in March. But it's nice to be able to uh, be able to hold the event in some capacity online and to an even larger audience than it would have been previously. So that's fantastic. So I guess um, to give you a brief overview of what this event will be about, um, its primary purpose, I guess, is to bring together uh, workers from very disparate corners of cultural heritage, including curators, educational staff, and industry professionals, to really uh, discuss the utilization of uh, novel technologies, including lots of different um, methods like uh, 3D printing, obviously, uh, Paul has just talked about that, uh, but also other more exciting brand new technologies that are just reaching the marketplace, like augmented reality and virtual reality, in addition to other um, supplementary forms of presenting um, cultural heritage content, for example, uh, online digital databases, among others. And I guess the real purpose of why we're here, I guess, is to bring together these disparate corners in order to basically discuss how we can utilize these technologies to better present museum content and narratives to audiences. And I guess to, in a way, evaluate how we're doing so far, and I guess, in a way, set the path going forward. Um, naturally, in this vein, uh, we've gotten together um, a series of um, 12 speakers uh, from all over the field, from uh, academics working in university institutions on their own specific applications directly related to their research, uh, museum professionals um, whose day-to-day -day grind is basically finding ways of presenting this um, learning of content for the public, for public engagement in new and novel ways that really get the message across in quite, quite exciting and most importantly, um, rich experience inducing ways. And, I guess the third group that we've tried to bring together are the active practitioners, those whose jobs it is, they may be found in companies, so maybe it's their day-to-day -day job of uh, developing software and hardware solutions and applications for cultural heritage activities. This is obviously, as uh, Paul has mentioned, particularly timely given our current very uncertain space within cultural heritage. Uh, we're obviously living through an unprecedented time, as cliche as that, as that sounds right about now, where um, COVID-19 and the ensuing uh, lockdown uh, globally has put a severe strain on um, how we can, or basically how cultural heritage institutions are even allowed to exist right now, which obviously has been rather detrimental to many. And... Obviously, this will have a large impact on the landscape for cultural heritage institutions going forward, um, least of all as part of this um, current trend of lockdown, but even afterwards where we'll have to be thinking about working on considerably tighter budgets. Not only that, but uh, probably having to work in a more online fashion whilst the previous physicality of many museum and cultural heritage institutions uh, not, doesn't fade to the wayside, but certainly becomes more difficult to sustain. Uh, on, on a lighter note, however, so what we've got planned for the next two days are two afternoon sessions, one today starting imminently, and then one tomorrow afternoon, uh, both starting 2 p.m. and running till about 5.30 or 6 p.m. in the evening. Um, these will be three talk-led sessions for the final panel discussion to round off the event tomorrow. So, session one. Uh, which will start shortly, once I've finished talking, uh, will be on 3D visualization in the humanities, i.e. just uh, a few or 
basically our speakers will be speaking about uh, their experiences and applications of applying uh, 3D visualization technologies within, as the title implies, the humanities. This will be chaired by myself, or Wilson, and it will be opened with a keynote speech by Daniela Petrelli from Sheffield Hallam University. Uh, this will be followed by a further three talks by Dr. Alexandra Franklin of the Bodleian Libraries, Dr. Daniel O'Flynn of the British Museum, and Dr. Fabio de Agnano of uh, the University of the West of England, or UE Bristol for short. Uh, after this, it will be followed by a short 30 minute break before session two resumes about 4 p.m. Uh, session two will be on 3D visualization in the natural sciences, a very simply uh, applications of 3D visualization technologies within earth sciences, biology, and paleontology. Uh, this will be chaired by uh, Paul Smith, who spoke previously, and will be opened with a keynote talk by Dr. Imran Rahman, the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, and will be followed by a further three talks by uh, Professor John Hutchinson of the Royal Veterinary College, Miss Kate Burton from the uh, Natural History Museum and uh, UCL London, and finally, uh, and Dr. Andy Jones of the Lapworth Museum of Geology over in Birmingham. Finally, um, not finally, um, so our third session will resume tomorrow, the 2nd of December, starting with uh, at 2 p.m. with a session on 3D visualization in, in, and industry. Um, this is basically a chance to give a, a few companies a chance to spotlight their own work and sort of share their experiences on how they have delivered uh, 3D visualized content to cultural heritage institutions and the public. This will be chaired by uh, Professor Mark Williams of WMG, the University of Warwick, and will be opened with a keynote talk by Thomas Flynn from Sketchfab, with a further three talks by Stephen Day from um, Cambridge-based Think, Think C 3 d uh, Drew Wilkins from Leamington-based Fish in a Bottle, and Richard Allen from PaleoPie, um, from, or from Oxford-based PaleoPie. Again, this will be followed by a 30-minute hiatus, whereupon we will resume with the final session of the event um, at roughly 4 p.m. This will be a panel discussion entitled The Future of 3D Visualization in Cultural Heritage. Uh, this will feature the return of all three of the keynote speakers that we've had for the previous three sessions, so Daniela, Imran, Thomas, and we will discuss the theme of the changing landscape, how cultural heritage institutions are exploiting and are currently um, utilizing technology, these technologies now, how they are, how they have been using them and how they will be using them in the future. Uh, particularly under the lens of the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact that it's had on cultural heritage institutions, as um, formally discussed. As formally discussed. Um, so uh, that's about all for the event. Just a few notes that uh, Jack has already mentioned. So again, conference is organised as four individual sessions. If you wish to register, if you wish to see them all, you'll need to register for each individually. Which, um, if Jack has not already, he will share them down below. Um, I would also like to give thanks to the Institute of Advanced Study at the uh, University of Warwick, who were kind enough to provide the, um, the funding required for this event through the Accolade Programme and the IES Awards Scheme. And again, I would also like to thank the Oxford University Museum of Natural History for sponsoring the event. They were going to host it physically when we were going physically. Alas, that was not the case. But I would certainly like to thank Paul Smith for uh, kindly um, offering assistance and for Jack Matthews for organising the uh, behind the scenes for the event and uh, I guess without any further ado I will say um, enjoy 3D Viz and again don't forget to register for the sessions and we'll get rolling with session one now. So um, I would like to welcome everyone then to uh, our first session, um, session one of 3D Vision in Humanities. We'll be starting a little bit earlier, that's all good. So uh, in order to avoid retracing what I've said already, uh, this session we'll be looking at several key applications of 3D visualization technologies within the humanities, with the speakers sharing their evaluations, experiences, and insights of the applications that we've carried out. So, um, I mean, I've already covered this briefly, but what, how we this gonna work is we are gonna have, um, a, first of all, a, a longer keynote talk with Professor Daniela Petrelli, which will be 25 minutes, followed by a brief Q&A, um, then we'll have our three remaining talks with Alexandra, Daniel, Fabio. Um, these will be 15 minute talks again with a five minute Q&A. So for the audience, as Jack has probably iterated, but for those who are just coming in, 
Um, should you have any questions, uh, please enter them into chat at any point during the talk. Obviously, these will all be saved at the end, where after uh, I will be positing your question to the speaker. Uh, should you wish to follow up, simply um, um, ask your questions in the chat and we'll get you sorted out. Uh, for the speakers, uh, simply put, um, when you have, um, you'll have obviously the, the time you're allotted. Uh, when you have five minutes remaining, I will turn on my video and I'll silently signal uh, the number of minutes you have remaining, so five. And, um, and I'll repeat this again at two minutes. And then oh, obviously we have a bit of a time buffer, but um, please try and wrap up at that point. Otherwise I will have to cut you off, which is uh, what none of us really want. So I guess um, let's proceed, shall we? So um, I would like to introduce our first speaker, our keynote speaker. I would like to introduce Professor Daniela Petrelli, Professor of Interaction Design at Sheffield Hallam University. Daniela specializes in novel forms of interaction design that combine digital technology and product design. She is especially interested in investigating hybrid digital physical scenarios in cultural heritage and will talk to us today about integrating AR and VR into the museum experience. So, Daniela, how's the weather? <laughs> sunny, incredibly. I feel this sunny. Hello, uh, hello everyone, and uh, thank you very, for the introduction. Um, uh, yes, I today I'd like to, to share my insights on. Uh, um, uh, the insight again uh, through empirical studies uh, where I looked at, at 3D reconstructions uh, and how they could enhance the, um, the visiting experience of heritage. Uh, the topic is not new, as you can see in that uh, paper of 20 years ago. That was a, a survey of, uh, uh, of what was at that time already the second generation of uh, 3D visualization. And if we fast forward the 20 years, what we have now is that those visualizations are now in use, highly detailed, highly interactive, and running on, uh, on mobile devices, like in this case, a tablet at the Conciergerie in Paris. Another option is to use headsets and uh, in order to enter the place and have a glimpse of the past, uh, as it was done in this case uh, for the Modigliani exhibition in London, where they reconstructed uh, his uh, studio and uh, you would be able to see it in VR. These type of experiences are very popular, very popular with visitors. Uh, my pictures here don't show the queue, but there was quite a long queue outside uh, of the room. Uh, these, uh, for me, are, uh, um, to give you a sense of what it means to, to run one such event. So you need to have personnel to, to manage the queue, but also when inside, it's not enough to have the technology. You have to have uh, um, assistance for, to clean the devices, to uh, help people wear it. And uh, um, yes, the experience is definitely memorable, but the, the making is really demanding and expensive expensive both in terms of technology and in terms of expertise from the reconstruction of the of the building to taking uh, photographs of original objects then you have to recreate uh, virtually and also the the final render rendering of lights and shades to make the display the place believable before that experience, uh, the Tate already had experimented with creating, um, uh, recreating a studio, in this case, uh, the Mondrian studio, and also a physical reconstruction. You can imagine now we could augment that uh, physical reconstruction with augmented reality by pointing our phone on the different objects. We could trigger multimedia content and so enrich the, the, the physical space with, with digital. Uh, in essence, uh, my argument is that uh, augmented reality and virtual reality are equally effective, but the experience as visitors are uh, quite different. Augmented reality uh, makes you look at the reconstruction from the outside. You are outside and we're looking in. And one feels uh, immersed in the reality, you still have a sense of the real world around you. And the computer-generated content is overlapped, as in the example of the conciergerie in Paris. The virtual reality is what Bodigliani Studio uh, offers, so an immersive experience uh, where one looks at this, the studio from within, and you don't feel today around you. Around you, you only see the virtual representation. 
So my interest is to try to unpack augmented and virtual reality. And for this, I set up a, a, an empirical study to compare and contrast augmented and virtual reality to understand what visitors prefer and why. And if the type of heritage makes a difference in the way people uh, use these two different technology, how they appreciate it, and what professional think of, of both. Um, the starting point for this research were two uh, virtual reality video games. Uh, one uh, is the Chantry, um, created for Dr. Jenner's House Museum and Garden in, uh, in Berkeley, in Gloucestershire. Uh, the game shows the house uh, uh, as it was at uh, uh, Edward Smallpox and the British society at that time. The, the game is an environmental, uh, environmental narrative video games, meaning that there are no characters, uh, there's nothing to do uh, apart from exploring the space. What you, what you find around are traces of human habitation and fragments of stories that uh, the player will find to, to um, uh, have a better sense of the, uh, the space. And now I would like to, to play a, a, a snippet of the video game, if the video could start, please. This deserves closer inspection. 24th of January, 1823. My dear William, I hear by your father that you will return in a few days to Bristol. Be assured you will take with you my best wishes and affections. I am happy to certify that no boy could behave better than you did during your stay with me at the Chantry. Pursue this line of good conduct, and you will be happy yourself. Make your father and everyone who loves you happy too. Your affectionate uncle, E.J. This was a breakfast room. I always imagined this was a centre of family life in the doctor's own. So, uh, hopefully this uh, little snippet uh, um, was a good example to show the type of, uh, uh, of content that is being created for the game. So, from one side, a very uh, um, accurate um, surrounding with sound, but also voices and actors played the different, different characters and different stories. Uh, this game, the full game, is intended to be played uh, at home or at school as, as an educational tool. We also used it in the museum itself as part of a special event like uh, uh, in, in this photo. However, my interest, particular interest, was to see if the content that is in the game could be reused on portable devices. One aspect, one reason for this is because it's extremely expensive to develop such, uh, um, such games, to create such an accurate environment and, and having the actor playing the story. So if we are able to reuse the same content, this of course is, uh, is in different ways, it's a, a better use of, of the investment. So one option to, um, to see this reconstruction in place is, um, is to use a tablet as an augmented reality. Here is the breakfast room, and you can see how it was in 1823 and how it is now, the, the museum shop. So the tablet, with the tablet, you open a window on the past and you are able to, 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 look, to look around and compare um, yesterday with today. An alternative way is uh, um, to deliver the same content um, as a VR experience or, on a stereoscope. Here the visitor is immersed, immersed in the past and you can see um, um, the work the uh, design, product designer can do in, in transforming what could be a, a Google box in a, an object, an interesting object that you are uh, happy to end and, and carry with you. So both solutions are possible. The question is which one is preferred and why? And uh, do people, do visitors be, uh, behave differently if when they end one or the other one? So the, as well as two different devices, um, I looked into the fact of two different heritage sites. Um, the, the first setting is the one that I've already me mentioned, Dr. Jenner's House Museum and Garden. Um, uh, that, well, the second one is the, the reconstruction of the Forum of Augustus in Rome. 
Uh, the forum is not there anymore. There are only fragments left that are hosted in the Trajan Markets, the Museum of the Imperial Forms in Rome. In the figure, figure there, you see a, a fragment of marble that is, is a part of the statue of Mars and Venus that you see on the poster on the wall, while on the bottom right, there is the reconstruction of the statues as you see them inside the game. So the statues of Mars and Venus within the temple of uh, Mars the Avenger. So by, by studying these very two different settings, I wanted to see uh, if the type of heritage uh, made a difference in appreciating the reconstruction, how people would use it. So the, in terms of interaction, the tablet and the stereoscopes displays exactly the same content. Uh, and the content was automatically selected uh, via beacons, the, the small uh, white square that you see around the circle. So these beacons were distributed in the museum or uh, uh, in the different rooms at the general house. And while entering the room or approaching the, the uh, exhibit, the device would automatically would sense the, the beacon and would automatically select the um, the cube map that is relevant for that place. And so the visitor would automatically naturally interact with the scene without having to select different uh, um, different views. So with the stereoscope, the visitors will really literally have just to, to watch around and turn and see and see the place. While with the tablet, there are two options. One would, could uh, turn around with the tablet, or uh, as in the picture, one could use um, the fingers to move the, um, the visualization around and it would be possible to play the content, the snippet of a narrative by touching. The, um, the content would be displayed, uh, indicated as a marker with the, the little hand. Inside the, um, uh, the, the stereoscope, uh, this picture is, is quite complex, but shows uh, in full everything that is going on there. So here, our visitors is in front of the fragment of the hand of the uh, Colossus of Augustus. The bottom, the five, um, the five squares show the, the uh, cube map. The first one is the colonnade. Uh, that is physically, you say, behind you when you're looking at, uh, at the Colossus. Uh, the second and the fourth one are the two sides of the of the hole where the colossus is, and uh, the the third one is the, the the bottom part of the colossus, the status of um, eleven meters, and the on the the fifth, so the first one on the right shows you the the ceiling, but also the head and shoulder of the colossus. Inside the main picture, there's two little squares show you the type of interaction. So if you notice in every single of the, the little square, you see a white dot in the center. That is the focus of your uh, of uh, of the visualization. And when the, the dot touches a hot spot, then it's transformed into a circle, as you see on the square uh, on the top right. And that is when the, um, the content, the narrative starts to play. So I said we, we reused the, the content of, uh, of the game apart from uh, the garnet of um, uh, Dr. Jenner. So the game is itself completely inside the house and, and uh, in the cemetery. But in real life, when a visitor goes to the um, Jenner's House Museum, there is the exhibition inside, but there is also the garden. So we created three. Uh, animations specific for outside. Uh, and uh, we, we put uh, curious objects, like in this case, there are um, blood bags hanging from a tree representing the, the story of the experiments of Dr. Jenny using human blood as a fertilizer. So they, I don't have enough time to uh, tell you all the details of these empirical studies. You, if you're interested, you can find the, uh, the, the details there. Uh, but I would like to give you a flavor of, of the work. So the two, the two parts of the study were similar, but not identical. So Dr. Jenner's house, uh, the house museum, we had um, seven rooms uh, taken from the video games, plus three animation of the garden, in the garden. The, um, the visitors used both uh, tablets and the uh, stereoscope uh, visor. 
uh, and they visited both in indoor the house and in the garden um, at the end of the visit they uh, filled in a questionnaire and then we observed and take took notes on, on of their behavior the um at the trajan forum um, we only had the content from the video game and here again the participants use both the tablet and the visitor but instead of uh, of visitors we had professional professionals as participants and uh, what they do was to uh, um, use the devices uh, filled in the questionnaire and we observed, but they were also discussing among themselves. So there was this uh, uh, dynamic of uh, a sort of peripatetic uh, focus group while we were visiting the museum together. The finding from, from Jenner's house, uh, overall we had uh, 20 participants. Uh, this was about 20, 40% of uh, the visitors we invited to, to, to take part. Reason for not taking part were different, not wanting to um, uh, to engage with the technology, but this is a discussion that we can have on the side. Those who um, took part and tried, they preferred the tablet, and the, um, the reasons was because it allowed a comparison with uh, today and the past uh, in an easier way, uh, and they were always uh, aware of the surroundings. Uh, it was a day for a special event, so there were several visitors in this, the room at the same time. And they also mentioned the fact that it was uh, easier to share. However, uh, we saw that beyond two people, it became more complex and they were actually passing the tablet uh, around. In terms of using, most people use the tablet li literally as a window uh, in the past or turning, turning around and only few people um, use their fingers. Those who prefer the, the tablet, when they use the visitors exactly in the same way, so they kept pulling up and down the visitors in the yard, so really they wanted to compare the past and the present, while th those who prefer the visitor, they uh, enjoy the experience of feeling the past, of being immersed in there, so you know, they separated the looking around the room and looking at the past. Interestingly, the, um, the elderly preferred the, the visitor because it was uh, they, it was brighter and had a, a better view. A few more uh, findings for the genesis that the, the narrative, um, it was commented as, as a, a clashing uh, with the exhibition. The exhibition is about vaccination and um, the discovery uh, of uh, vaccination, the smallpox on the world, where the, the content of the uh, that visitor will find in the, in the devices was about the personal life. And they instead appreciated very much the animation in the garden. Um, so um, this starts to say something about the, how, the content, which type of content is appropriated for the place. is the best one, the most suitable. Uh, we also observed that the discussion, the, the group of visitors had together was uh, um, driven by the exhibition rather than by the visualization. And uh, as big, as the museum is very small, it is possible to imagine that the visitor would go initially and visit the exhibition itself and then take the device to tour again the, the house and see how, how it was in the past. Uh, defining from the form of Augustus, we had 11, uh, 11 professionals taking part and uh, the, the finding was the opposite. The, the stereoscope was the most preferred. Uh, because the feeling of the past, but uh, most importantly, because there was a the sense of proportion of the human size respect uh, to the normal space or respect to the uh, enormous status of the Colossus, for example. And also the fact that that visualization allowed to um, appreciate in a better way the rich decoration and was a, a more fun and stipulating and engaging to, to have. Um, those uh, those professionals that prefer the tablet, they wanted to stay in, in the present uh, and uh, having an awareness of the other visitors. There could have been a little bit of uh, embarrassment in using these, uh, uh, these devices as well. But they acknowledged, even if they prefer the tablet, they acknowledged the, the, uh, 
the stereoscope was more engaging and, and interesting. And also acknowledge the fact that the tablet is a bit a too common a device to engage visitors today. That there is no novelty in that. Um, for the findings of the Forum of Augustus, really uh, in the same uh, in the same way as uh, the Dr. Janus, um, visitors lamented the, the type of content that was not appropriate. Here, um, again, they said the content was not suitable. Uh, in particular, there was an interesting example. When we were in front of the statue of Mars and Venus, uh, an historian suggested a, a short dialogue full of humor where v Venus is uh, calming down the, the belligerent Mars. And then this could be used to explain that Mars uh, uh, is not allowed within the Roman uh, city boundary and only uh, is allowed only if Venus is uh, at his side as she is the only one that is able to control the, the god of war. So this is very much the same type of story that we developed with Genes, uh, for Genes Garden. So self-contained humorous story and narrated with passion. Um, an interesting suggestion was uh, to offer views that are not the usual one. For example, being on the roof and looking down to appreciate the full size of, of, um, uh, uh, of the form of Augustus. And the professional uh, discussed also issues related to management. How many devices would they have? Sometimes they have thousands of visitors inside at the same time. It takes three hours to visit all the Trajan markets. So, rather than giving devices that the visitors have to carry around for a very long time, maybe the better option is to install um, some of these uh, uh, stereoscopes in place to, to have a look at the past. This is a, a, a photograph taken uh, after the study. Uh, I had an opportunity to test um, with two, um, two further people. Here we are in the Forum of Augustus, and the finding is exactly the same. So people prefer, the two, these two participants prefer the, the stereoscope. First of all, because uh, the, the light, the glaring of the day, made looking at the tablet more difficult. And secondly, as you can see, there is very little is left of the Forum of Augustus. So uh, it wasn't really meaningful a comparison today in the past. And this brings me to uh, discuss with you the, the guidelines or, or some, how I elaborate these findings as, as guidelines um, that could be, could be used. First of all, there is a clear value in offering 3D visualization as part of the visit. And one should be mindful, however, of the differences. VR provokes an emotional, an emotional and visceral reaction, the sense of being there, while augmented reality is more of a cognitive activity, invites comparison, the past and the present. So uh, it, another point is, is about the content. Um, in both situations, there are no characters uh, around the space. There are only voices. And the interaction is limited to looking around the activated snippet of narratives, very carefully created. So while one might be tempted to add more interactivity, for example, uh, uh, quiz or, or games, uh, from the visitor's point of view, uh, those are not needed, they're not necessary more interaction. The experience of looking around the past is uh, in itself already engaging and satisfying. And this brings me to the, to the second guidelines. What is uh, fundamental, extremely important, is, is the, the quality of, uh, uh, of the visual. The, the visual we're standing, and that is enough. So the effort should be spent on creating outstanding visualizations rather in, than creating additional interactions. <clears throat> the, um, to, to pair with the visual, we have to create a specific content. We've seen that the, the content that was really successful were the animation in the garden. The animations in the garden and the the historian actually suggested a, a story that was very close to this one. So short, humorous stories told in a dramatized way uh, are much more um, effective and pair the content, uh, the visual content in, in, in a perfect way. The last um, 
three uh, guidelines I'd like to suggest are very practical. Um, first of all, think about the usability and develop the easiest possible interaction. In the, the interaction we, uh, I have tested, we have implemented, it was literally just moving around. The selection of the scene was done automatically through the beacons and um, nothing was, uh, was requ requested apart from, from looking around. And this uh, goes hand in hand with the guideline number five, that you should test it in place uh, to resolve any possible usability issues. Uh, when we when it took the the, um, the test, the, the, the devices and the beacons at the Jenner's museum, we discovered that uh, the, the signal from one beacon could be um, detected from uh, the floor, from the room that was a floor uh, below. So, and this meant that the system might be shifting from one visualization to another one because two signals were received at the same time. And so we had to direct visitor to a place or another one. So uh, uh, it is extremely important to test it in place to resolve this issue that might not happen in your, in your lab, but that occur in real life. And uh, uh, last uh, but not least is, uh, important to, co the, to consider how the devices are going to be managed in every heritage. I said the two were very different, one very small, the one very large, and they, uh, they were pointing to two very different ways of using the same technology. So to, um, to summarize, uh, augmented and, uh, and virtual reality are very relevant and very important for creating a memorable visiting experience, but they, they have quite an opposite effect, uh, cognitive for augmented reality and uh, visceral for, uh, for virtual reality. Um, the, the, the preference is to some degree subjective, um, but there is a certain effect of the type of heritage that is there. Uh, so there is an influence of the heritage and the decision should be taken to take that into account. So you should be mindful of uh, what do you choose and uh, uh, consider how this plays in the context of, uh, uh, of the exhibition. Um, so uh, the surrounding and your installation, they work together and it's important to consider the two in that way. Don't discount the uh, the novelty, the fact of the novelty. Uh, it's the same in the same way also the the day to day management because um, it makes a, a big difference, particularly for the people that are uh, in the museum using and doing it all the time. And my very last slide uh, is just to acknowledge the the role of the Reveal project, not only the funding from the European Union, but the work of my colleagues. Those are the ones who created the games and on which my work, uh, you know, it made possible my work. And I'm very happy to, to take any questions and hopefully we have a bit more than five minutes. Oh, I see questions there. All right, brilliant. So thank you very much, Dan da Daniela. Uh, that was fantastic. So uh, we do have a few questions in the chat. So first is from uh, Megan Caston. Oh, there is um, another one before, I think. Yes, so uh, she put the so that's oh, uh, she put okay. it in the chat first, then followed by Imran. So, um, so um, how long did you aim for the video game to last? And uh, on top of that, um, and for this to be effective, and at the museum, how many VR devices did you anticipate would be needed for the relative what, number of visitors? The, the 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 two games are available on. Uh, they they were developed for um, uh, VRPS, so they are available on the Sony uh, game um, distribution center. You can go there and buy it for for five euros, and you can play it at your house. They last between uh, uh, one hour and, and uh, 90 minutes. So when we tried then uh, only in the Chantry, we were able to try it. And you need, as, as I showed you, uh, um, uh, th there was a, a, a picture of, uh, uh, of the setting. There were two positions and uh, uh, you have to uh, register before. 
um, you have to have volunteers there all the time, people were sitting down. Uh, it, it was a much more complicated interaction than the one at the Modigliani, because Modigliani is, it was really, uh, uh, you know, a couple of minutes, so you didn't touch anything, there was no physical interaction, while for the game there is, um, there is a, a console to control. So it, it depends on the setting. Again, there have been the use of virtual reality in, uh, in museums depends very much on what you have available. Do you have, for example, assistance all the time? It's illegal to have uh, people playing with VR under the age of 12. So you cannot just leave it there for people. There are questions of hygiene. You need to clean it all the time after every use. So uh, there isn't one size fits all. There are a lot of constraints that arrive with virtual reality. That is one of the reasons why I wanted to try to take the same content in in the museum and try to use it in, in a meaningful way this that way so one could see the the virtual reality with the stereoscope while visiting and then going home and decide to buy it and play right there you're muted that would help so our second question is from imran Rahman. Uh, did you consider making the games available to download on users' personal devices, e.g. smartphones, as well as through equipment you supplied? Um, well, the, the, um, the video game is a separate story, uh, in the sense that the video game can be played if you have the VR, uh, the PSVR setting. The cubes that we had, yes, in theory, they are, they are downloadable on your devices. Uh, for me, it was interesting to experiment with the two. So yes, you could download it and use it as a, as a, on a mobile phone. Uh, the mobile phone already, however, is small. So if you want really to have a, an augmented reality experience, the tablet for me is the, the, the right size. Um, uh, I think there is also a factor on having something that is given to you in, in the museum. I've done some studies before uh, comparing exactly you download something on your phone instead of uh, um, a tangible interaction that was uh, uh, offered to you by the museum. And the fact that it's something novel is not your mobile phone. It, it transforms the experience in something that uh, uh, more engaging, more interesting. So there is some value in in creating something special and particularly you know the box the the um the case that my colleague created is not the function is the the one of google cardboard but it's very different when you have it in your hands it transforms literally your experience in something special brilliant fantastic so our third question is from martin kostel uh, will you use a video mapping tool combination of 3D prints, it can be a really good experience because it gives visitors access to interaction between them. I didn't get it. Can you read it again? Sorry, um, uh, the, the question is, will you use a video mapping tool? Video mapping tool in terms of projection, projection mapping? Uh, if you'd like to clarify in chat, Ma Martin. I guess what we'll wait for him to clarify. Um, I have, uh, sorry, yes. So a, a, a projection mapping on the, uh, I use projection uh, in different uh, places. There could be an option if, uh, uh, you know, it depends very much on what you want to do. Uh, for example, in General's House, we were thinking of uh, using some, uh, uh, creating a kind of magic mirror. So you would see, you would see in the mirror, you would see the, the room as it was before and yourself inside it. Yes, we could project, but the projection changed the, the room itself. So, uh, and it's only partial, you know, uh, you can create it as an event. There are situations in which, you know, you enter the room, you sit down and then there is a projection mapping and it's very, very effective. The purpose is very different. So it's, it's is not to have a managed event, is that you take the, the, the object with you. Projection could be very effective, but it's not the same, um, the same sense. For example, it would be impossible to have a projection mapping for the, the Forum of Augustus that I don't remember how you know, hundreds of meters long. 
So um, you have, in a certain sense, designed the experience around the heritage that you have and take decision of what is more effective uh, for, for that specific place. So projection mapping could be extremely, extremely interesting. You could, you know, I've seen it projected on, on statues when the statues talk to you, and that is very interesting and engaging. Here, the purpose was, was very different. Cool, fantastic. Thank you, Martin. So uh, one last quick one before we move on to our next speaker. So, uh, Daniela, this is from me. Um, do, uh, have you had uh, any issues with people actually kind of playing, not really, I guess, interacting in the way you expect and just kind of like playing with the devices instead, almost like a ludic play rather than, I guess, engagement with the content itself? Uh... Yes and no, in the sense that what I tend to do is to create self-contained, uh, um, um, let's call it installation. So the technology is there, but you don't perceive it as technology. So in this case, for example, yes, you could, uh, in the tablet, you could try to exit it and, and, and do other things. And this is quite a normal thing, you know. Museums put their tablets for the visitors to do something, and they do something completely different. The moment you encapsulate that the same technology, like in this case, it was just a mobile phone inside the case, you you change the perception of that object. So we've done tests in the past where we had the, the augmented reality on a um, on a wooden case shaped like a, a magnifying glass. And so people were using that as a magnifying glass. Clearly inside was a phone and uh, they probably if they paid a little bit of attention, they could see it was the phone and probably they could start to play it and, and break it, break the magic of the experience. But at that point they enter you know, they, they, they like to enter in these uh, uh, different experience and pretend they are just holding a, 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 you know, a magnifying glass to look, uh, to explore the, the objects in a different way, or in this case, you know, to, to look back in the past. Uh, so it's, uh, I, I prefer to create, probably because I'm in design, but I prefer to create experiences than just uh, technology that you can download on your mobile phone and use it on mo your mobile phone. It's part of the setting the scene. So you vi we visit Heritage because we want the excitement, something different, uh, uh, because we're interested in what is there, not because we want to stay on, on, again on our mobile phone when we do it all the time for too many hours a day. All right, fantastic. So I think with that then, thank you very much, Dan Daniela, for your keynote speech. And uh, we will uh, move on to Ale Alexandra. So um, I would like to introduce Alexandra Franklin of the Bodleian Libraries. So she is the main coordinator of the Bodleian Centre for the Study of the Book, where she coordinates programmes aimed at making special collection material more accessible to the public and practitioners. Uh, she will be talking to us about the application of 3D optical profilometry to visualize historic collections. If you'd like to take it away. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and hello to all the panelists on this panel and to everybody in the audience. Um, uh, as Paul has said, I'm the Bodleian Libraries. It's a sister institution of our virtual meeting place in the University Museum. Um, and my role is really to uh, try to support academic engagement with the library special collections to help people use rare books in Bodleian collections for teaching and research, and especially to identify new ways of communicating about these collections to higher education audiences. The project I'm going to tell you about relates to the Bodleian's collections of engraved copper plates, like the one we're seeing on the right hand side here. It was funded by the John Fell Research Fund of the University of Oxford, um, and it was uh, aimed at looking into not just the prints, like you could see on the left, but the matrices from which those prints and picture prints and book illustrations were made. But it was also, although a relatively small project in itself, pushing for a paradigm shift within the library, breaking through the surface of the page into the third dimension in our own thinking about what it is that we collect and curate. 
The Bodleian is really lucky to have historical printing matrices in the collections, like the 17th century engraved copper plate showing mosses, which is made for a botanical publication. Many copper plates were sold for scrap by the printing industry uh, over the centuries. But actually dealing with surviving copper plates and other printing matrices has proven difficult for institutions that hold this kind of material. That's mostly printing museums and libraries. And the Bodleian is no exception. The Bodleian Library has about 2000 copper plates, mainly from the 17th and 18th centuries. Some of them have been in the library for more than two centuries, but only a handful are shown in the online library catalog and none are really fully described. There is a story that in the mid 20th century, the copper plates that we looked at for this 3D visualization study were used as the counterweight for a lift in Oxford's science library. That would be just across the, the parking lot from our virtual meeting place. And this is plausible because uh, that group of 290 plates would have been really heavy. Um, sadly, the story can't be independently confirmed, which hasn't stopped me uh, telling it to you today because it's a useful story and it's something uh, that perhaps colleagues in museums will recognize even after the plates moved out of the printing house in Oxford University Press and into a cultural institution, these functional objects didn't immediately assume the status of archival objects, much less uh, artistic objects. They seem to exist in a limbo as if people can't quite forget that these were part of the machinery of publication. So the idea of them trundling up and down in a lift shaft for several decades is somehow a good metaphor for that uncertain status. The thing is that institutions haven't really been sure whether copper plates and other printing matrices should be described in relation to the content that they carry or for their own materiality. And hence my slide here, aren't these just very heavy backward reading versions of the pages of books? Well, the plates that we selected for our study were made to illustrate a book by Oxford's first professor of botany, Robert Morrison. A few had been professionally cleaned and we chose a very small sample of eight out of the over 290 in this collection, some cleaned and some uncleaned plates to image. The richness of the other sources about this publication opened the door to using this particular collection of copper plates as a test case. They could be linked to the plant specimens themselves, obviously a great tradition of natural history in Oxford, university archives detailing the manufacture of the book at the Oxford University Press, the proof prints we can see on the right hand side of this slide, and of course the many copies of the printed book in Oxford libraries and around the world. And here I need to add another element that influences thinking about printing matrices in the Bodleian. This is the library's printing workshop or our version of an experimental archaeology lab. Among the ways that people learn about rare books when they come to the Bodleian is through the experience of craft, crafting things themselves, making paper and printing. So all of that was the context when we initiated, as I say, with the help of the John Fell Research Fund, this short project into imaging the copper plates and thought about what we wanted from the images. First, we wanted to know what could be learned from the plates themselves. 20 of the plates had been professionally cleaned and our conservators in the Bodleian libraries wondered what would high quality images tell us about the effects of cleaning. Art historians and historians of printing wanted to know what where happens to plates going through the press. Could we measure the different depths of lines with sufficient precision to detect uh, differences before and after pressing? There's quite a strong argument that the wear to plates that uh, we detect on old copper plates is um, due to corrosion and subsequent polishing, i.e. the cleaning itself, rather than from the pressure of the printing press as has often been asserted. But we also wanted images to show what was unique about the plates. Uh, we already know that the shape of the lines in an engraved or etched uh, image in a copper plate is, is different depending on the method. 
uh, engraving, cutting with a burin um, into the plate, into the hard plate, or etching, biting with acid into the plate. But could this, these differences in the shape of a line be shown in greater detail? And at a more basic level, a fundamental lesson for students uh, and for librarians is recognizing the difference between early methods of printing, broadly relief printing from metal type and other surfaces, and intaglio, which is the method that we're looking at in the copper plates here. We try to train people in recognizing the different methods from the printed item, but how much better to have the physical examples to demonstrate that. And, and referring back to one of um, the slides that we've just seen, um, somebody saying, uh, it's just the gut feeling you get from actually seeing. So now um, I think we would see our video, please. Optical 3D profilometry was carried out by the Laboratory for In-Situ Microscopy and Analysis, Lima, at the Department of Engineering Science, and this is my colleague, Kalan Draganevsky. The results were analyzed in February 2019 at a Lima user seminar and at a workshop for curators and historians of science. Turn to the slideshow. I'd like to digress for a moment to give us a chance to think about what we mean by 3D visualization in relation to books. Um, but pages are flat, you might say. Um, when we can show books live, special collections librarians take a great deal of time communicating the material facts of books, the research that's gone into understanding paper, pigment in paintings, even the characteristic structures of sewing by the binders of manuscripts and printed books. Nevertheless, it's true that the disciplines that study books and manuscripts have traditionally focused on what is on the page. And our digital libraries still overwhelmingly contain 2D images of page surfaces. Even the British Library's uh, wonderful turning the pages feature shown here manipulates page images into something like the sensory experience of the codex book, yet what you see is still the surface of the page. In recent decades, there's been a coming together of curatorial expertise and conservation science into what's sometimes called the archaeology of the book. This has put greater emphasis on making evident the material structures and layers of craft and use that have gone into the creation of manuscripts and printed books. A new story just last month showed how students at the Rochester Institute of Technology found a palimpsest, that is a, a manuscript writing hidden under another manuscript, so an older manuscript underlying one from the 15th century, despite the somewhat misleading headline here. And on the right, there is a picture of a project by Texas A&M University's Book History Workshop, a 3D visualization of a hand mold, a tool that's used for casting metal type letters. And they used this, uh, this to print a 3D model of the mold. Um, and a tool like this brings the haptic experience of this piece of printing history within the budget of more institutions. Special collections libraries also take an interest in how people think about books today. And this is especially as the death of the book is announced annually. One clue is in the books made by artists and many of these works rebel against, or let's say play with the idea of the flat page and the codex format. Um, and here's Maria Welch's 2019 erratic obsessions. It folds out from a little map case into this multifaceted item uh, which the artist has designed to be displayed in 3D. So perhaps instead of struggling to make those heavy inconvenient copper plates fit nicely into our collections of page surfaces, we might ask how we could use them instead to tell the 3D history of books. Well, four days were allocated for profilometry scanning in January 2019. Um, to give a very brief uh, layperson's, definitely, I am definitely a layperson in this explanation of optical 3D profilometry, and I'll defer to um, the experts in the audience. It's a process of taking hundreds of measurements with a light beam at different focal depths and combining those to generate an image of the surface of the object. The usual use for these machines is in engineering to examine the texture of the surfaces of machine parts, say. And we're hugely grateful to colleagues in the Oxford Department of Engineering for sharing their expertise and for making these images for us. 
Examinations using the Alicona optical 3D profilometer were carried out on small portions, about four centimeters square at the most really, of each of eight plates. Um, I was told that scans of the entire plate surfaces would take a great deal longer. Um, we just didn't have time for that in the, in the project. And what we can see on this slide is on the far left, corrosion, so surface buildup from corrosion. Um, at the center, we can see the image of a section taken through an area of engraved writing, showing the length of the lines below. You can see the, the measurement of the length of the lines in microns. And on the right is shown how a small segment of a design is put under the, under the 3D profilometer. And the image is shown in a different polarization and then a 3D visualization from the data. And here are the comparisons of cleaned and uncleaned plates. As I said, on the left-hand side, we can see the, the clean plate uh, there's an image of the, the profile and the, you can see the section through and the depth of the grooves. Um, and on the right hand side, a, an uncleaned plate. Um, and then you can see the depth of the grooves there, much greater depth if we compare about 34, 35 on the clean plate um, and up to 139 microns on the on the dirty plate, showing the greater uh, height from the corrosion. So optical 3D profilometry offered us three things. The first is high resolution measurement. Despite the curvature of the plates, engraved lines can be clearly distinguished in the data and the depth of different lines can be measured. The second thing is that we could look in 3D at the shape of the engraved line in the copper rather than the shape it made on the page. We get one step farther back or farther forward, if you prefer, in understanding the crafting of the printed image. And the third thing is the opportunity to take the visualization and create models of things we haven't been able to see so clearly before. Um, I really like to have a, a model uh, of this image. So the further steps we can contemplate based on these results are the things I've, I've tagged in red on this slide. Um, using a test plate to measure the wear caused by the different elements of the printing process. So we have sent one test plate through under the optical 3D, and now we want to press it many times again and then measure it again. Um, making visualizations of different types of lines, etching and engraving. Um, making a replica plate, probably we would use different technology for that. Um, but finally, for me in particular, the value of visualization was in the process itself of creating the images. These became the focal point for discussing the copper plates with experts in other fields, including many of our colleagues in the university, people who deal with similar items, um, engraved copper items, but that are but that are in other museums. And this ex helped to expand the view of what was interesting about the copper plates. I'm really pleased to say that under the AHRC Collaborative Doctoral Partnership Scheme, we've been able now to recruit a doctoral student in partnership with the University of London to study another collection of copper plates in the Bodleian. That's some 750 book illustrations that were collected in the early 18th century. So this story does go on, um, but I will end here and thank you. All right, brilliant. Thank you very much, Alexandra. That was an excellent talk. So we have uh, one question for the audience from uh, Laura Piers. Uh, were there conservation concerns about the optical 3D profilometry technique? And if so, how were they addressed? Um, there certainly were concerns. Um, and uh, it was colleagues in our conservation section who took um, the responsibility of uh, carrying the plates uh, to the lab where they could be analyzed. Um, but these were allayed in great part because the type of uh, the profilometry that we were using is non-invasive. In, in other words, it does not touch the surface of the plate at all. It's the light beam that um, touches the, the surface um, uh, and not the instrument itself. So from the point of view of conservation, these plates were lying on a flat bed of the machine, um, and it was just the, the light beam that was taking the readings. 
All right, fantastic. So uh, one from me. So um, you mentioned about your collaboration with um, Lima. So uh, how how did that come about exactly? I guess it's uh, rather unusual for a library and an engineering department, I guess, to intersect. Yes, it's great. Um, well, what happened was I, of course, uh, being a complete novice uh, and not knowing you know, really how to begin, um, what I found was a wonderful resource um, it, in the University of Oxford, which was basically a database of instruments and uh, facilities available to everybody. Uh, and that um, I mean, I don't know if other universities have this, but it, it really was the, the, where the journey began because I looked in that and I thought what I want is, I think what I want is a microscope to look at things. I, I mean, I think that's what I want. Um, but in particular, I'm looking at something that is some place where they're expert in looking at surfaces. Uh, and that's, that's how I found uh, the lab there in engineering. Um, they had put on, they have, this, uh, they had they, they made a brief explanation of what optical 3D profilometry was. And I thought, well, yes, that's right, because what we want to look at is the profile of these copper plates of the incised lines that are going into the, under the surface. Um, and, and basically that's what they do all day, only with probably much more regular um, surfaces uh, for, made for modern machine parts. Excellent. So we have our next question is from Daniel O'Flynn, our next speaker. Uh, can the technique be applied to curved or 3D surfaces? Um, well, I would have to refer you to the um, experts on that. Um, the machine that was used for these has a flat bed on which the plates sat. However, um, what I would say is that the, the plates themselves are not perfectly flat on their own surface. So there was certainly some intelligent, you know, software um, comparing what was the very top surface with what was a, um, a line cut into it. Um, but for that, I would have to um, refer you to, the, to, the, to my colleagues in engineering. Thank you, Dan. Of course, of course. So um, we have another question from Ellie King. Uh, is there anything else in the collection that you could use this technique on? That's a really interesting question. And um, I think, I mean, we were lucky in a way that these are metal. That seemed to be that they they seem to be perfectly happy with that. I know some people had suggested that um, with metal things, there's reflection and then that, and that can interfere with what you see. Um, but you know, of course, the people at, um, at the Lima lab said, well, we look at metal all the time. It's no problem for us. Um, I don't know whether it would be the same with something like the leather bindings that we have, um, stamped leather bindings. Um, and, uh, you know, in other, in other um, materials, yes, I don't know. I'm, I, I will have to ask the experts in the audience what they think of that idea. Yeah. All right. Excellent. So we have another question from uh, Michael Bennett. Uh, how is the data from the 3D profilometry exported from the capture device? Are there possible digital formats non-proprietary and in turn able to be rendered and examined in other 3D applications? A really crucial question. So you might have picked up that um, the reason that I was showing you that nice little film is that I don't have those um, data on my own computer. So that is basically kept in that, um, that software. Um, that I, I think I've been told that it's, that it would be allowed and it's possible for us to export that data in order to say, to make a 3D print of the, of that nice line that I really like. Um, but we would, we were not able to simply download that data ourselves. Um, so the film that I have is a, you know, is actually literally looking at the screen. Um, that would be the next step of what we'd we'd like to do. Cool. Uh, one quick one before we move on then from me. Uh, when when are we going to see those those are 3D prints? <laughs> <laughs> yes, great. Um, well, I'm really happy to say that in our printing workshop, we are currently hosting a 3D printer. 
So perhaps we can make progress on that. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Um, so we'll have just one last one from, from from Christian, which just came in. So is a more detailed scanning plan, for example, by structured light scanning, which would be perfectly suited to this type of object. This should then be combined with an in-depth analysis of 3D data. I am taking what you say, Christian, and I am taking it to heart. This sounds like um, something I would really be glad to hear about. Yeah. OK, please, please do write to me with that. All right, fantastic. Uh, with that, then, thank you very much, Alexandra, uh, for, for, for your talk. And with that, then, we'll move on. Uh... Sorry, there we go. Uh, so next, I would like to introduce Daniel O'Flynn of the British Museum. Uh, Daniel is an X-ray imaging scientist at the British Museum, operating CT equipment in the non-invasive investigation of archaeological and historic materials. He will talk to us about the utilization of X-ray CT at the British Museum and several key applications that they have undertaken there. Take it away. Thanks very much, Paul, and good afternoon, everybody. So I thought before I would start, I would just give a quick introduction to the British Museum. Um, the, the museum was established in 1753 and its purpose is to tell the story of human history, of civilizations and the interactions between different cultures. And 100 years ago, a, a research department was founded in the museum. And the reason for this department being founded was um, during the First World War, um, a lot of the collection for its protection was put into storage. And when it came out of storage again, um, some detailed research needed to be done in order to assess their condition. And the department is 100 years old this year. And in the bottom left of this slide, you can see a photo from last year of our some of our department. We are um, we're approximately 30 members consisting of full-time staff, postdoctoral researchers and research fellows, PhD students and um, emeritus scientists. And the other two photos to show you are just some some fun historical ones. So the the two gentlemen in the in the centre there, that photo was taken in 1951, and they are studying bowls from the Sutton Hoo ship burial. And on the right hand side, just above me here, is a photo of Margaret Sachs. And Margaret actually still works in the department as a as an emeritus researcher. And this is Margaret in the 1960s operating a a piece of equipment called an optical emission spectrometer, which I don't really know much about, but apparently it tells you the elemental composition of materials. And the, the mission statement of our, of our department is, is research preservation dissemination. And what I mean here is that we, we study the, the museum collection to gain a deeper understanding of it and to assist in its preservation for future generations. And it's very important that we, we disseminate our results to the public through academic publications, um, talks, also um, social media and blog posts, any, any method like that. So my job is um, as an x-ray imaging scientist in the museum and um, you might be wondering why you would use x-ray imaging in a museum. So there are a few questions that we, we seek to answer when we look at objects in the collection. One might be how the object was made. So sometimes using X-ray images, we can look at the materials and the, the techniques in which we use to create objects. We might want to learn what, what its current condition is. For example, X-ray imaging is very good at revealing cracks in um, underneath the surface of objects. And if any later repairs or additions have been made, especially using different materials, X-rays are very good at picking that kind of information up and the kind of the most exciting one is is there anything hidden inside so as you might know x-rays are a non-destructive way of looking inside an object so if we want to preserve an outside object which is in a box or it's wrapped up in something or it's covered under a layer of corrosion we're able to look inside without damaging the surface and obviously this, this whole conference is about 3D imaging and 2D X-ray imaging has been around for a very long time. And, and I just wanted to kind of quickly explain the difference between the two methods before I go into it. So the photo I show you here is of Elizabeth, the, the mother of Queen Elizabeth II 
in 1935 and here she is in the Middlesex Hospital having a hand x-rayed and what we have above her hand is an x-ray tube which shines a beam of x-rays through her hand and, and underneath her hand will be some photographic film, x-ray film, which records an image. And what happens here is when the x-rays pass through her hand, they are absorbed by, by some materials in the hand more than others. So the bones in her hand absorb x-rays much more strongly than the, the tissue and her skin. And, and also her ring that she's wearing on her left ring finger is obviously made of metals, as is her bracelet. And you can see these dark regions on the image where, which correspond to that. So we're able to get a very nice picture of her hand underneath the surface. This, this kind of flat X-ray image, which is sometimes called a radiograph, you might have heard it called a radiograph. That's very useful for, for the human hand. But when you come to such a, um, the human body, the torso, where you have a lot of overlapping, interesting structures, sometimes a 2D image doesn't tell you everything you need to know. So later on, it, um, the, the CT scanner was developed, and this is what a CT scanner looks like. And what a CT scanner does is gives you a 3D picture of the inside of, in this case, the human body, but it could be of any object as well. And the way you take a, a 3D X-ray image is to take a series of radiographs, so a series of 2D images, each one at a different angle around, around the patient or around the object. So in the case of a CT scanner in the hospital, the patient would lie on the, on the bed here and inside that donut shaped structure is a, an X-ray tube and a, and a detector which spin around very quickly. And as the patient is passed through the center of that donut, a series of images are taken at all angles around the person, which is then used to reconstruct a 3D picture of the inside of the person. So, this is the lab that I work in in the museum. This is the X-ray imaging lab, which is located underneath the museum. It's about 25 meters underground in central London. And the main bits that make up this lab are an X-ray source, which you can see on the right hand side, which fires X-rays a bit like a like a, um, how a torch would fire lights out. It fires them towards an imaging detector, which is it's essentially what a photographic film would do or the, or the sensor in, in, a, in a camera. It takes a picture of the x-rays. And then if you place an object in between the x-ray source and the detector, then you get a picture of what's inside that object. And crucially, we have a turntable, which you can see is this big metal disc at the bottom of the image here. And that allows us to rotate our object around and take a series of images from different angles, which is what we use to make uh, a CT image and give us a 3D picture of our object. So why would you use a, a CT instead of a, of a, of a normal x-ray in a museum context? So I'm going to show you a few examples now of why we would do that. So the first example is of a cuneiform tablet. So just to give a brief introduction to cuneiform, it's one of the earliest forms of writing. It dates back over 5,000 years. And the writing was made by using a reed stylus to make indentations in wet clay. And then when that clay was dried, you ended up with a tablet. And these tablets are quite small. They're, they're both the examples I show here are, are about nine or 10 centimeters along their kind of vertical axis in this picture. And the, the image on the left is of, of a tablet, which is sometimes known as the first day of school tablet. And this is thought to be from a young scribe learning how to write using the reed stylus, learning how to write cuneiform. So this just consists of the same character repeated again and again. The image on the right is a very famous cuneiform tablet from um, Columbia University. And this tablet actually shows the earliest example of Pythagorean triples. So this isn't, this isn't words you can see here. There's, these are actually numbers. And each, each row of text here shows you what we know from a squared equals plus b squared equals c squared, so the, uh, the Pythagoras rule of um, right angle triangles. And this actually predates Pythagoras by over 1,000 years. Um, so what I'm going to show you now is a cuneiform tablet, which is in the British Museum collection. Sometimes cuneiform tablets were also used to detail records of administration. And these tablets were often encased inside envelopes, also made of clay. So what you can see in the center of this slide is a, is a, a clay envelope, 
with a tablet inside and there's some damage to the top left corner of the envelope so you can kind of see the the tablet poking out on the inside and what what this is is essentially an administrative document which was sealed up in an envelope we think to protect the ob the contents of the tablet from being tampered with and then afterwards when the tablet was sealed up in the envelope uh, there was a, um, a seal pressed onto the surface and just to show you an example of what such a seal might look like this is this is a so-called cylinder seal and this is a this black object here is a small carved piece of stone which will be rolled across for example a wet clay surface to leave an indentation such as you can see on the right hand side here and that's had the double effect of of making the cuneiform on the envelope itself difficult to read but it's also pushed the envelope into contact with the tablet so what you have is a clay tablet with a clay envelope directly touching it which means that even if we did want to break open the envelope which we wouldn't um it would be very risky and we would potentially break apart whatever's on the inside so when we started doing x-ray ct imaging in the museum i wanted to know if we could see what was on the inside using a ct scan and, and detect any writing on the inside what i show here is a flat two-dimensional x-ray image of the tablet so what this tells us is that there is a tablet on the inside that's intact, but it doesn't tell us anything else. So it's not very helpful. So what I did in this case was to take a series of images, hundreds, hundreds of X-ray images, whilst rotating this tablet through a full 360 degree rotation. And in the video I'll show you now, we will see the, um, the CT reconstruction. We could play the first video, thank you. So this now is what you get from a CT scan. This is the object as uh, from its surface, and what's important to show you here is that the you don't just get the surface, you also see what's written underneath the surface as well. So what we can do is vi virtually, digitally peel away the outside layers and reveal the text that's underneath the surface. So these wedge shapes that you can see here are actually hidden underneath the surface. And that pr proceeds through the, through the tablet, we can see that, and then we can see the internal structure of the tablet as well. And then doing a bit of processing of those CT images, we get something that looks like this. And now this is writing that hasn't been seen in 4,000 years. So I was very excited to see it. But obviously I can't read cuneiform because I'm a scientist, but luckily in the British Museum, we have scholars, curators who are able to do this. So I showed this to Jonathan Taylor, who's a curator in our Middle East department, and he was able to translate the cuneiform and this is what it says on the left essentially to save you from reading it it details a large amount of wool which was transferred from a large city called gersu to a small village called gaka and it tells you the names of the people involved in the transaction and the name of the person who put their seal onto the envelope and the year in which the transaction took place and the crucial point here is that we did all of this without damaging the envelope and the tablet is in intact for future generations to to see and to study. And the, the last example I wanted to show you of where we've used CT imaging is on a, an ancient Egyptian mummy mask. This, um, the most famous type of mummy mask, which you'll all be familiar of, is um, that of Tutankhamun. His, his mummy mask was, was um, solid gold. Typically they were not, this, this mummy mask and, and many others were made of uh, a material called cartonage, which is a, a mixture of linen and plaster. And then that was decorated on the surface with in this case, gilding and, and paint. And we had this in the lab because I was talking with a curator in the Egypt and Sudan department in the museum called Marie van den Bush, And she was very interested in the inside of the mask because she was able to look inside underneath the opening of the mask and see there was some structure inside there. And she, she was interested in the manufacturing process of these masks. So we wanted to know if we could get an image of the inside of the mask um, using an X-ray CT because the, the gap is too small to fit a scanner inside there. And then the mask itself is obviously quite delicate because of the material it's made of. But a CT scan doesn't give you any color information. It just tells you structures and materials. So what I'm gonna show you now is a video of a combined CT scan and, and surface scan. And this surface scan was taken by Amelia Nolson who was a visiting um, PhD researcher at the time, and now she's a teaching fellow at, at Leeds University. 
and this is this is now a structured light scan of the of the mask, which shows us all of the detail and the the funerary text in hieroglyphs which surround the headband of the mask, as well as a painted decoration on the front and back. And now we switch to the X-ray CT view, which shows us the detail under the surface. So what we're able to see in this scan, and I'll show you some freeze frames in the next few slides, but we're able to see some of the, the manufacturing processes that took place, such as the, the gilding and also the, the mold that was used to make the impression on the inside of the mask, which we can see here, which obviously shows you a lot more detail than you see on the outside in some places. And you can also see, for example, the texture of the, of the linen on the inside of the mask as well. So now I will show you a couple of, of freeze frames of, of that data. So this is a, a shot here, and just to zoom in on it. So when the when the mask was decorated using gold leaf, they were it was applied in thin layers to make this gold detail, and they and they overlap in some places. And, and on the surface, it's very easy to disguise that by smoothing the surface. But the X-ray picks up where the overlaps were which is shown by the yellow arrows here, which gives us some insight into how the, um, how the mask was decorated. What we can also do is get a nice view of the inside of the, uh, the mask here. And it should be noted that this isn't actually a human face that was used here. This is um, a mold of a face that was used. If you look, for example, the tops of the ears are much higher than eye level. So this is very much a stylistic interpretation of a human face. And just as, as a last image to show you here, this is um, cross-sectional images that have been taken. One like straight through the, the center of the mouth of the, the nose like this, and one through the, the, the front of the nose like that. And this shows us some layers. So we can see the, the kind of dark, the light gray regions are um, where the, uh, the, the plaster and linen mix was in the, in the cartonnage. And this bright white part we can see here is a material which we think is gesso, which is a kind of paint which was used as a base layer for for decoration to be applied for the for the um on top of the on top of the base layer of cartonnage. So Marie and I are currently studying a series of mummy masks from different locations and time periods to identify patterns and differences in the ma manufacturing processes. So that that brings me to the end of my talk. I'd just like to thank the following scientists, researchers, and curators who helped me with that work, and um, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much, Daniel. That was an excellent talk. Uh, so we do have a few questions in the chat. So uh, our first question is from uh, Laura Pierce. Uh, are there certain materials that work better with this process of revealing layers of items? Would it work with textiles, for example? Yeah, that's um, yeah, very important point. So x-rays work best where they can pass through the material and out the other side without being significantly scattered or absorbed by the material. And the materials which are particularly bad for absorbing and scattering tend to be metals. So gold, lead, iron, you can get images through them, but it's, your image quality is generally very poor and it, it would work with textiles. So the, the mask I show you there was, was comprised of a lot of linen, which we're able to pick up with the CT scan. All right, fantastic. Our second question is from Adam Frost. Uh, hi, what is the relationship between spatial resolution and object dimensions? It seems to scale well between very small objects and larger ones. So, as Paul will know, the question of resolution in a CT scan is a, is a fairly complicated one. Um, it, it, as, a, as a kind of ger very general rule, the the smaller you can get your object and the closer you can get it to your x-ray tube and rotate it around, the better your resolution will be. But that depends on the x-ray tube you use and how well you can focus your image with that x-ray tube and, and the, the characteristics of your detector as well. So the system we use is a bit of a compromise between having um, a very high power, which allows us to go through metals, but also having a small enough spot on the detector that we don't get too blurry images. So you, you generally you can blow up your images by magnifying them to, to an extent. And by blow up I mean expand, not literally explode. Um, and you can you can pull out some detail by zooming in on your images, but you'll always hit some limit eventually. And for our system, it's probably of the order of three hundred microns or so. All right, excellent. We've got we've got a fair few questions here. So uh, next is Imran Rahman. Uh, were the tablets challenging to scan because of their shape? 
i.e. one axis shorter than the other, leading to variation in penetration between the axes. So the, the, the tablets weren't too bad. Um, the, so the perfect, just to say for non-CT experts, the perfect shape of object for a CT scan is a cylinder, because as you rotate it through a kind of 360 degree scan like this, the dimensions of the object wouldn't change if it was a cylinder or a sphere. Um, when, when you have objects like tablets, which are longer on one axis than the other, you, you can end up with some imaging artifacts, but the, the clay that these tablets are made out of was quite forgiving in that respect, so we didn't have any, any big problems there. All right, fantastic. Uh, we have another one from Christian Seitz, nice and short. Uh, were the 3D data for the cuneiform tablets further analysed? Um, there's a bit of an ongoing project with looking at more cuneiform tablets. Um, I'm very interested in what we can see under the surface. So objects hidden in envelopes, for example. Something else was brought to my attention uh, recently, which is that there are some tablets in our collection, and I'm showing collections across the world, where due to their history before or after they arrived in museums, salt crystals have developed on the surface. And these salt crystals obscure the texts in completely but it's a risky, you, you wouldn't want to try and remove the salt because you might damage the text underneath. So that's something that we would very much like to do with them, um, X-ray CT imaging to see if we can read the text under the surface of this salt. In terms of engaging with tablets, I've actually been in touch with Steve Day a few times about this, and, and I know he's very keen to get a, a CT scan of, of one of these tablets where we have the envelope and then we have the tablet on the inside and you can physically hold both of them without obviously breaking open the, the tablet, uh, the envelope, sorry. But th this this needs you to do a process called segmentation, which is where you digitally remove one piece from the other. And that's quite tricky in the case of our tablet that I showed you here, because because the material is the same on the outside and the inside. And in some places there is actual physical contact between them. It's a little bit tricky to do that. It certainly could be done, but it would be very time consuming. Right, excellent. Uh, we do have one more question from Michael Bennett, but I think we're going to have to cut the Q&A session there. So if you'd like to answer that in the chat for Michael, that would be great, Daniel. Cool. So with that, uh, we'll move on to our third and final speaker of session one. Uh, I would like to introduce Fabio D'Agnano of the University of the West of England, or UE Bristol. Uh, Fabio is an architect who specialises in 3D design and digital manufacturing and is also the founder of Tuteco. University spin out specializing in providing access for blind and partially sighted individuals. He'll be talking to us about Tuteco and how it assists BPS individuals within the cultural heritage sphere. So, uh, if you'd like to take it away, Fabio. Uh, you're on mute, Fabio. Still nothing, I'm afraid. Fabio, could I, Jack Matthews here, could I recommend just closing your window and reusing your link to come back into the room and that would should just refresh. I should say, while we are um, waiting for Fabio to just um, reset his connection, just a quick reminder that if you have any questions, please do ask them in the chat and click the small circle to the right hand side and that will mark them as a question for Paul to pull up. And a final reminder that this conference is made of four sessions. You will need to make sure you are registered separately for all the sessions you wish to attend. We look forward to seeing you later today for session two and then back tomorrow for sessions three and four. I will put another link up in the chat for, for you so you can register for those sessions. But we're very much looking forward to seeing you there again. Do make sure you're registered for those. I can see Fabio's joining us back in the room and I can hear him. Fabio, can you hear yeah. me? Hello, good evening, yes. It's, it's so, all working perfectly. Fantastic, uh, thank you for having fantastic. me here. Uh, Do you want to turn your, just turn your back, there we go. Take it yeah, away. We have everything. So thank you for having me here and sorry for these two minutes delay. I will be um, uh, faster, I will go faster. So we all know how uh, important it is for us to visit museums. And right now, especially uh, that this right is in some way diminished. And uh, well, for some 
um, people, these extraordinary restrictions are just common. This uh, page is intentionally left uh, black. Uh, in uh, the world, there are more or less 285 million people that are visually impaired, uh, 39 million of them are completely blind. If you want to imagine that, it's like uh, if almost all population of the United States was visually uh, impaired. Still today, uh, the huge part of uh, the cultural heritage is not entirely or properly accessible all over the world. Uh, Oxford done, have done a, a great job in this field, uh, also the British Museum, but not uh, everything is accessible. So uh, I started working in this field uh, in 2013. Um, with um, a university uh, spin-off uh, that was dealing exactly on this, but then uh, we made a um, giant leap forward uh, when we met uh, Deborah Tramentozzi that you can see here in the picture. She's completely blind from uh, her birth, and at the same time, she's passionate about uh, art. Uh, so after working with her, really, we had a, a better idea and understanding how uh, we could uh, go forward. And so in this uh, system, in this project, we put together hearing and touch in order to uh, give to the visually impaired um, an independent experience, an interactive experience at the uh, museum. Uh, it's actually a special ring, but you could do it also with any kind of smartphone that uh, just simply turns objects into speaking models. So you can uh, touch a specific feature and have a relevant uh, audio description of what you are uh, talking in that uh, specific moment. Uh, in terms of uh, technology, uh, this ring has a Bluetooth, so beacons capabilities, and uh, at the same time, at the same time, NFC uh, sensing, uh, which are small uh, and uh, passive sensors that you can put on the object that don't, don't require normally uh, batteries and uh, special maintenance. And everything is held on uh, the smartphone or the audio guide that the person has. So you can put it directly on the original artwork if you can do it. There are a lot of places where you can actually touch the originals. Otherwise, you could uh, use it in tactile maps, or which is the example that we will see at the end of the presentation when you do when you make replicas of real objects. So we started um, with the first big project uh, in Rome. This is the Arapaches. That was in 2017. Uh, we had there the original, let's say original, actually they were Roman copies of all the family of Augustus. And then you could touch um, the statues and have an audio feedback, not only uh, the feedback, but also an history behind uh, everything that was um, in first person uh, told by, by uh, the protagonist. So it was engaging not only for blind people, but for all which is uh, what we aim, it's at the sign for all, uh, not only experiences for uh, blind people. And in this case, we pushed a little bit farther because this exhibition was um, in partially like blindfolded, so it was in the dark, so you could experience exactly the same way that a visually impaired um, experienced that. And um, this was made with, with a wristband instead of a, a special ring. And uh, right now we uh, go straight to uh, the last project, which is called uh, UNESCO for All Tour. And it's connecting four different UNESCO sites around uh, Europe, in Bulgaria, Croatia, Italy, and uh, Spain. And the idea is, again, that you can touch some 
uh, some objects, some features, and have um, an audio uh, feedback. The uh, project is still ongoing. We've finished up all the models. Um, COVID stopped the project for six months, but nevertheless, we, we could um, still uh, finish it. These are some of uh, the panels, the models, which combine 3D modeling, um, images in sometimes because it's really an experience for all and two and a half dimension uh, tactile printing. These are the replicas, pictures of the replicas here you can see and um, right now we will see and I ask you um, the video to, to please start. Uh, this is um, a video of well, I would like to talk on it, so if you could um, reduce the volume, please. Um, so, this is a making of that we made um, at the Center for Fine Print Research at the University um, in Bristol. So, this uh, part is about the tactile models that were uh, in some cases. Uh, CNC, so uh, we had the 3D scanning, and um, I don't know if you actually can see it, uh, so this, this is the first part where we uh, made the uh, computer control uh, machine from Reddit, and this example in particular is uh, interesting, my own project because it's combining uh, standard 3D CNC printing, which, as you probably know, doesn't um, allow any kind of shape, so you can't, for instance, produce undercuts with another technique, which is resin printer, which is the opposite, um, gives you the opportunity to print almost any object. Uh, with some restrictions, so what we did was to combine uh, both uh, techniques, um, which is in some way uh, an artisanal uh, way to do it. I can see that someone is asking to reduce the volume of the video, but I think that I don't have the right to do it. Um, so in, in now, uh, the model, which is made with a UV resin, has been washed. And right now, we are combining the models. Uh, if you want, I can stop talking. I will stop talking because, okay. So, I will stop.
Well, I think that right now the music is more or less uh, finished, so uh, sorry for this. If you have any question regarding what you saw and that I couldn't explain, uh, well, feel free to do it now or, or in other ways. Um, I am back here now, so um, I can already um, see one of the questions. Cool, cool. So uh, thank you for your talk, Fabio. Apologies, everyone, for, for the uh, for the sound issue. It just seems to be a limitation of the platform. So um, I guess we have our first question, Fabio, from uh, Ellie King. So uh, thanks for a great talk, Fabio. Uh, can I ask, what's the relationship between the research that goes into this work and the commercial spin-off produced? Uh, what is the balance, and has the technology been adopted in many museums? Uh, well, thank you. This is actually interesting because it started within the university. Um, possibly wouldn't have been possible to develop it further without, without uh, the fact that it was mm, that they started in the University of Venice, so not at CFPR. And uh, then it became uh, a commercial product always, which is not really um, um, a, a real commercial product. I mean, it's commercial, but it's uh, in some way, uh, you know, uh, we invest everything in research, 100% in research. And because the idea is to uh, make it as common as possible. Uh, so uh, for the question that has been adopted in many museums, uh, well, the, the answer is yes, we, we, we did it in a, in a few uh, museums. We, we plan to do uh, as many as possible. Um, of course, it's not 100% commercial product. So we don't have, for instance, a marketing structure to, uh, to just market it. And uh, that's why it's going a little bit slower on the market side, 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 but is is doing great with research. So right now it's here in Bristol, and we are always developing and and going ahead with this. So it's uh, to to answer short answer, it's really half half market and research. All right. Fantastic. Uh, so we have uh, a question from uh, Daniela. Uh, have you tried uh, with non-visually impaired people? Uh, touch is a powerful sense underused in heritage uh, where we tend to favor sight. Yes, uh, thank you, da Daniela. This is exactly what, why we started, because, you know, there's much more than, than catch the eye. And, and sometimes we think we see art and we don't see it. Uh, Deborah herself, she can't see and she um, explained me some details about some paintings that I couldn't see just because, you know, our, our sight is fast, but it's soon, soon often distracted. And, and yes, touch is a powerful sense. So the idea is design for all. Let's use touch. Let's use smell. Let's use hearing. Let's use whatever. And mostly we should all do it. Also the non-visual impaired because, because it's another approach to the same thing, which is always beneficial I mean. All right, excellent. So uh, one from me, Fabio. So um, what kind of feedback have you gotten when uh, people have used uh, Tutecto before? Well, the, the first time I, I brought it to, uh, to a, um, a visual impaired, that, that was really at the beginning, and uh, it started touching a roof, and the description said that it was a roof, and he told me, oh, thank you for explaining me this because this saved me for minutes and minutes of possible, you know, confusions because you, touch is powerful but doesn't have a lot of memory. So you can't really uh, immediately understand what is there. So uh, the feedback was really, really, really uh, positive uh, because it's easy. Uh, but of course, it's starting from the feedback that we build on. It's a, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's a project that is built on on feedbacks, actually. Of course, of course. So um, I think we have one final question then uh, from Alexandra. So um, I will probably be get get time for yours as well, Michael. So uh, Fabio, did any audio description projects involved 
involve people touching original artworks and is there research comparing that to touching the facts please uh, yes we did for instance the, the first one in arapachi was the original even if those original were roman copies of greek original you still can i mean it's still a, a couple of um uh, mil millenniums so it's still, still we can consider them originals uh well of course uh, for everyone the original and the copy is not the same thing i mean for us too uh being in front of an original gives you uh you know a, a, a power of time of age of everything that you you mean you feel even if you don't see and if you don't touch uh but yes mm. Oh, thank you, Alexander. Yes, that's original. Yes, yeah, I agree. Uh, so it is different uh, uh, in every sense. But uh, when you touch a perfectly made replica, well, you, you can't tell the difference. Uh, of course, sometimes you have to change materials. For instance, uh, the original is in metal and then you make it in just monite, So it's not the same thing or uh, in some kind of raisins. So it's, it's not it's not the same. But we don't stop because it's not the same. We always say this, it's less, but it's better than zero always. And now the normality is zero. All right. Thank you very much, Fabio. So um, Michael was just uh, thanking you for, for, for the awesome talk. So with that, then, uh, we shall draw uh, session one to a close. Uh, thank you for listening, everyone. Um, and uh, be sure to join us for the uh, our last session. Uh, if you have one more question in, in the chat there, before we close, if you just like that. Uh, yeah, and, let me. Um, uh, so, um, yes, uh, be sure to join us for session two, 3D visualization in the natural sciences, which will be taking place starting uh, uh, in half an hour at 4.30 p.m. If you haven't um, registered for that session and would like to, if Jack, you would like to put the registration link in the chat now, um, you can register for that and then follow the link of that. And then um, looking forward to seeing you all in 30 minutes with our next session host chaired by uh, Professor Paul Smith. Thank you very much. And, I will uh, answer privately. <laughs>